Good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Kasich from Invivo, and it's my pleasure to host this first program in the from the Innovators Workbench Medical Technology Innovation Series. And our guest tonight is Tom Fogarty. Over the course of the next several months, as this program plays out, it's going to be hard to resist the temptation to use the term legendary. But if the term applies to anybody in this industry, it is certainly Tom Fogarty. The archetypal physician entrepreneur, Tom has been a driving force in so many different areas, from device innovation to company creation. And for more than 30 years, he's been a central figure in global technology innovation with more than 70 patents and more than 30 companies to his name. In fact, I could spend the next hour just detailing Tom's accomplishments, but I think it would be better to let Tom do that himself. So Tom, welcome and thanks for the for being here and for the opportunity to talk to you. I know you grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. What was your early training like? Uh, and how did you get into medicine? By accident. <laughs> <laughs> now, my, uh, I'm a, I was brought up in a uh, German town, in a German neighborhood with an Irish name. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I was brought up in parochial schools and actually didn't do very well in school. I started college on probation. Really? Yeah. So, but anyway, I got through college and did well. I got interested in medicine because um, you could work in a charitable organization and were exempt from child labor laws. Oh. So you could start working at a very early age. So I started working in a, uh, what they call a central supply of a hospital. Oh, I when I was in the eighth grade, and they paid you 18 cents an hour, but it wasn't bad. Were you always creative? Were you always inventive? I, we're going to talk about your first medical device, but your first device, in fact, was a clutch on a brake. What was that all about? Well, it wasn't, wasn't on a brake. It, it's a concentrical clutch. And uh, when I was a kid, I, I worked part time uh, also in a small motor repair shop, and they repaired motors mostly for scooters that were motorized. They had manual clutches and the situation was when you went from a high gear into a low gear, you're going uphill. You lurch forward and suddenly you'd find a certain part of your anatomy on the street and <laughs> the scooter was about 10 yards ahead of you. So the concept of could you smooth that transition was something that a friend and I worked on, and actually it was a preamble to a centrifugal clutch. Did you have any ownership of that no, device? No, it, it's, that's where I learned a little bit about intellectual property and shop rights. <laughs> when, you, <laughs> when you work in a shop, the shop owns whatever you come up with. And so you studied at the University of Santa, and then you went to the University of Oregon. How did you make that transition, and why Oregon? I went to Oregon simply because I, when I finished med school, I wasn't certain whether I wanted to be a cardiologist or a surgeon. And they had what they call a rotating internship where you really got an exposure mm -hmm. to two months of um, medicine and one month of cardiology and two months of surgery. Mm -hmm. And so I thought if I get those rotations early, I can make up my mind early. Mm -hmm. And uh, I made up my mind after about two weeks on a cardiology service, I didn't want to be a cardiologist. Why's that? Because they didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> At that time. <laughs> they certainly do a lot now, but all they did was read AKJs and pronounce people dead. <laughs> that, that sounds interesting to me. So you chose surgery. Why did you choose surgery? You could have been an emergency room physician. They do lots of stuff. Well, back in those days, there weren't emergency room physicians as such. I mean, everybody rotated through the emergency room. There weren't emergency room physicians. <clears throat> I think I, was, I chose surgery because there was an immediate result to what you did. And uh, there was an immediate self-satisfaction, particularly if you did it well and right. Mm -hmm. So it was at University of Oregon that you designed your first product fight remember correctly. Take us through the experience. First of all, tell us what that was. Well, it was a balloon catheter, um, but it actually, it was during uh, medical school. Oh, it was in Cincinnati. Yeah, in Cincinnati. 
You know, when you, when you talk about inception, uh, I'll just tell you how it went. Sure. In, in um, high school and in college, I was what they call a scrub technician, and that's, you hand the instruments to the surgeon. But you're not a nurse, but you're a technician that knows what instruments the surgeon's going to need during a procedure. So I saw a lot of surgery. I saw what worked, what didn't work. And after multiple observations of people having blocked arteries, it became obvious that the technology that addressed it was inadequate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I think it was probably my freshman year in med school when I actually made an instrument to attempt to address that. Of course, it wasn't until my senior year and actually uh, that I got a physician to really look at it, become interested. He had been my mentor. Who's that? Jack Cranley, who was one of the first physicians to totally focus on vascular surgery. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went off for my internship, and then when I went back for a fellowship, that was the first chance we actually had to use it. Take us through that early, that first design development. What materials did you use? How did the conception, how did the idea come to you? How did you actually turn that from the idea that here's the clinical problem that needs to be solved to a device that would solve that problem? Well, in this particular situation, and it doesn't really represent uh, the most common scenario, it was almost like a light bulb mm -hmm. went off that, you, you know, if you put a thin catheter system down and you can make it bigger and then withdraw it and control the volume during withdrawal, you get the cot out. And uh, so I think I tried two or three other things that didn't work, but the minute that came to me, it was pretty clear it was going to work. Uh, how I got from that idea, uh, essentially I took what they call ureteral catheters, which are long, thin tubes. and I cut the baby finger off a of number five glove, and I tied it on the uh, catheter system with fly tying techniques, and that was the first balloon catheter. Uh, you know, I made probably the first two, three hundred myself. Really? How did you do that? At night. <laughs> <laughs> At night in my room. Uh, at the University of Oregon. What was that process like? I mean, you said that you started to work on the device in your freshman year, and it wasn't until your senior year that, cert, that it was used in, in actual practice. But what were you doing in the interview to testing, and, and why, was the, why was there a four-year gap? Were, 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 did you take, what happened when you took it to other surgeons at the University of Cincinnati? Did they tell you to go back to your books and cut it out and leave that stuff alone? or? Were they encouraging? What, what was that like? What was that uh, Essentially, like? they told me that. To you go know, away. To, that was crazy. It was inappropriate and dangerous. Yeah. Other than that, they thought it was fine. <laughs> 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 and, and would you sign over the IP rights to them? Yeah. No, they, at that time, they didn't think that way. In fact, at that time, that was not an issue. Mm -hmm. I know at the time that the, the notion of using a balloon shook up a lot of the conventional wisdom uh, among surgeons. Talk about that process. I mean, what, what, a lot of what the resistance that you ran into must have been from surgeons who said, we don't, we don't use balloons in our practice. What, what was the conventional uh, technique or approach at that time, and what was, well, how did your balloon turn that around? The, the conventional wisdom that if you essentially touched the intima, which is the internal lining of an artery, it would damage it and lead to thrombosis. And uh, so what you were doing with a balloon catheter essentially was scraping the intima over 360 degrees circumference, and they just felt it would uh, lead to immediate rethrombosis. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was conventional wisdom. When, when you sutured an artery, with a forceps, you never manipulated the intima. You just handled the external eventitial part. I mean, it was essential you don't do that. And uh, so it was contrary to the gold standard, conventional wisdom, and everything that was traditional. So it wasn't well accepted. In fact, um, we did, I think, eight clinical cases, wrote it up, and it was turned down by the major peer-reviewed journals 
in that era, three in number. <laughs> so if you write an article and turn it down, that means it's probably pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get, I mean, did, did you have the same reservations or did you know from the beginning that this concept was sound and it was going to work? You know, I didn't know enough about medicine to know if it would work or wouldn't mm -hmm. work. Um, and that's probably one of the attributes of not knowing something. Mm -hmm. You're not deterred because you don't know. Um, and I, I think that's often how a lot of things are tried. Now, the individual surgeon that was my mentor, Dr. Jack Cranley, I just had more insight than most. The insight wasn't great because when you had an acute arterial occlusion at that time, half the patients died and of the half who survived, half had an amputation. So to try something like that, um, you know, wasn't a great challenge because there was a lot of room for improvement. Mm -hmm. You told me that you learned a couple things from Jack. Uh, what did you learn from Jack Cranley and that, that you took with you going forward? Uh, put your name on a product <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and always patent it. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Was Cranley an inventor himself? No. No, he wasn't. That's interesting. Did you, how long did that relationship last with him? Well, he's still a friend. And Is he? I see and talk to him. What did he help you do in that process? I mean, it, it, the, the question is eventually how did you get from that instrument that you, that device that you were manipulating, creating yourself, manufacturing yourself, cutting off the tips of, of gloves to one that became a commercial product, but just give us a sense of what Cranley did for you. In well, that uh, the first thing he did, he, um, uh, he, he, um, arranged so I got access to the cadaver lab. Mm -hmm. So I could actually use the instrument in cadavers. Then he also kind of tutored me on what were some bench models that would be appropriate bench models. And probably the biggest thing that he did, he was the first surgeon that had the guts to use it. Mm -hmm. I know in those days, surgeons often jerry-rigged or, you know, put together their own devices to get something that to, to improvise something that, that they didn't have in the traditional armamentarium. How did you make that leap from, here's something that I'm going to use in my individual cases or my individual uh, practice, to this can be a widely used device and we ought to commercialize it and do all those things? Well, I didn't make that leap. In other words, I, I really was, I saw a clinical problem that was a big bad problem. Mm -hmm. And the objective was to solve that problem. And uh, the way to do it was, the only way to do it was to commercialize it. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, I set out to commercialize it. Uh, you know, I set out to design and make something that worked. Once documenting it worked, then you have to go through the process of making sure it gets out to the general population of physicians that will use it. Did you think of yourself as an inventor, as a did device developer at that time. Was it important to you to have that first device work or you think simply that you're a surgeon and here's a, here's a device you'd like to use in your clinical practice and you know it'd be widely usable? Well, I wasn't even a surgeon. I just said, you know, I, I, I said I can make something better than what we're doing now. That's what I set out to do. Mm -hmm. How important was it to make money off of it? I didn't even think about it. You didn't? No. I did afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> I want to. No, I, 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 you know, I didn't think about it actually, but um, as the process went along and I identified it had value, I started to think about it. Well, let's <clears throat> get to that. But I know you eventually hooked up with Al Starr and Lowell Edwards and the company that became Edwards to yeah. commercialize it. Who, who was Al Starr? Who was Lowell Edwards? And how did you make that connection? Yeah, Al Starr was the chief of cardiac surgery at the University of Oregon. And in those days, most, um, first of all, heart valves were just in their infancy. There wasn't a successful implant. And Al Starr, in conjunction with Lowell Edwards, who was an aeronautical engineer, essentially designed carburation systems for high-performance um, fighter planes. Uh, he wanted to make an artificial heart, and he talked to Al Starr at the University of Oregon. He says, what we really need is a valve. So the Star Edwards valve was the first successful 
commercially used valve replacement, and that was a ball valve. I was an intern at the University of Oregon. Al Starr knew I'd developed this instrument, and there was a lot of uh, rheumatic heart disease in that day, and a lot of emboli. And so, because Al was replacing valves, and the valves, when they dysfunction, embolize, saw a lot of emboli. So he got me to make a bunch of catheter systems for him and show him how to use them. So that's kind of the origin. So you moved from the University of Cincinnati to Oregon. To Oregon. How did you make, why did you go to the University of Oregon? I went, I went there simply because I was either going to be a surgeon or a cardiologist, and I get exposure to both. Mm -hmm. All right. And it was a very good surgical program. Mm -hmm. Now, Jack Cranley was an early mentor of yours, but, but really simply in vetting the technology and making certain that you could access to the cadaver labs. Was Al Starr a mentor of yours in commercializing? Well, how, did you, how did you get from having this technology in your hand to a product that Edwards, that what eventually became Edwards yeah, was what, selling? Essentially what happened, um, I, I was trying the next year, I was trying to get some company to make it because I couldn't make enough of these things. Mm -hmm you know, to satisfy the use of Jack Cranley and the other surgeons who were wanting them, and I started to canvas companies that I thought would be interested in making them, and I couldn't. I must have gone through 20 companies. And they all said, go away, little boy. And uh, Who turned you down? You name it. And uh, at that time, Duvall, Bard, Pharmaceal, uh, USCI, I mean, it was just yeah. a list, litany. and. Um, Al Starr saw the utility of it, and they had started Star Edwards to make the valve, mm -hmm. and uh, they were selling to the same customers, so he encouraged Lowell Edwards to come and look at it, and that's how the relationship developed. You had a patent on it, you obviously had your name on it. What was that first deal like, and, and who, who helped you through it, or did, were you doing this all by yourself? Was it a handshake deal, or did you have lawyers? Uh, I, I did it mostly by myself. Um, I had lawyers that I serially fired <laughs> or didn't pay. <laughs> uh, and it, it, you know, when I look back on that, it, it actually turned out to be a great deal. Um, I got a 10% royalty, which is unheard of in this day and age, but um, unless it's company to company right. royalty. But, and the reason that happened is that Lowell Edwards had a 10% royalty on his star valve, so he thought that was good for him. <laughs> it would be good for me, so that's how it transpired. But it was extremely painful, because you really don't know what you're doing. It's right. your first experience. You don't know what the reference points are of the parameters. It must have taken a, and mostly because of me, it must have taken a year and a half. How quickly did you begin to realize a lot of significant revenues from that? Uh, as soon as the first lawsuit occurred because somebody failed to use a Fogarty catheter. Really? How soon after that was a couple of years or almost immediately? Did the device, ta I guess what I'm asking is did the, did the device take off immediately? Nah, the, the, the device, the device, um, I think it took off reasonably well. Uh, now, but there was probably a, you know, uh, between the publication, once there was a publication, then it took off pretty rapidly. What year, what time frame we're we talking about right now? I think the first publication was in 63, uh, okay. late 63. Mm -hmm. Now, you, obviously, your reputation as an inventor and developer of devices is, is legendary. Um, having developed this first device, what did you do next? Did you begin immediately to start on the next device, or did you say, okay, that was great, I'll be financially set for a while, but now I've got to go back and do my real job, which is cardiac surgeon? No, I, I kind of viewed invention and innovation as, as part of what I did in my practice. Mm -hmm. So the next, uh, next thing was um, a series of clips and clamps and a dilatation catheter. What were the clips and clamps designed to do? And are we still talking about the, the mid-60s here? Uh, yes. Yeah, that was about 65 to 68. In that range, and essentially the, the clamps they use in vascular or cardiac surgery are metal clamps with unyielding surfaces. So 
Most uh, patients we operate on have irregular arteries and hardening and um, plaques. And when you clamp them, you'll crush them or clack, crack them. And that can lead to reocclusion. So the concept was to mimic a clamp with your fingers so you have soft pads. Mm -hmm. So it was the first concept that, that addressed the issue of clamping heavily diseased artery so you didn't cause extensive damage. Now, again, was that a, a concept that was well accepted by the community, or did, was it one that met resistance among surgeons? No, that, that was pretty uh, straightforward. straightforward and pretty widely accepted in certain areas. Mm -hmm. And the, the dilatation device, what was that designed to do? That essentially was designed to do what a balloon catheter does, except that it was a different method of delivering the dilating element. It was kind of a linear extrusion. Catheter system was inverted balloon so that it would unroll. Now this was pre-Grunson? Yes, yeah. So did you have an early conception of interventional cardiology as we understand it today? No. What, <laughs> <laughs> what did you think that dilatation device would do? I thought it would work. Mm -hmm. but what, pro what clinical problem did you think it was going to the one, the one I developed, yeah. the same one that Grunzig oh, you did. came out with, yeah. I mean, it was the same. The Grunzig balloon is only a Fogarty balloon, except it's non-elastomeric. It's fixed volume, where a Fogarty balloon is variable volume. Who was commercializing the clamping devices and the clips and the dilatation device? What was the process by which the, those entered into the <clears> mainstream? <throat> did you go back to Edwards and say, Edwards. I've got more stuff here? Yes. And how did, were they happy to yes. did you form a kind of informal, was it a formal relationship? No, it was, it was formal. Them? By that time I learned to be formal. Mm -hmm. Did you have a position at Edwards? Did I have a what? A job, did they have no, a formal no, position? No, were you no, an inventor no. in residence? Or? No, no, I was a consultant. You were a consultant. Yeah. And when you develop a new idea, you went back to Al Star and Lola. Well, and no, they, had, they had a six month option on concepts that I came up with. And uh, Sometimes they took it, sometimes they didn't. Sometimes they took it, gave it back, and then bought it back. <laughs> so, I want to get that because that was actually one of your most successful ventures. But in this intervening time, you got to Stanford in 1968, and prior to that, you had done some. You'd spent some time at the NIH back on the East Coast. I think back on the East Coast because I'm from the East Coast, but for yeah. you, it was all the way across on the yeah. East Coast. Uh, what did you do at the NIH, and why did you go there, and what, what, what did you hope to accomplish by being there? Well, I got to the NIH by mistake, actually. <laughs> uh, during the, the surgical residency, you had a year that you could go do uh, research. You could either do it at, at um, Oregon, University of Oregon, or another institution. At that time, there was a famous physiologist, cardiovascular physiologist at the University of Washington. So I told the chief of surgery I wanted to go do cardiovascular physiology at Washington. <laughs> and, the, and the guy's name was Rushmer, and he thought I meant the NIH. <laughs> so, which is in Bethesda, Maryland, but everybody identifies right. as Washington. So the next thing I was scheduled for an interview to go back to the NIH, and I said, no, no, I want to go to the state of Washington. <laughs> he says, no, 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 you go interview <laughs> at the NIH. So that's where I ended up. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> so it was very well planned. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you had a career trajectory all in mind here. Um, and then you went back to Stanford. How did you, then you went over to Stanford. How did you get to Stanford? And well, I got, why did you move, up, why'd you move back to the West Coast? Um, I got, I applied for a, fell a um, residency in, in cardiac surgery. And I was accepted back at Oregon with Al Starr and also at uh, Stanford. And um, at that time, they were not doing transplants. And transplants had just started. They weren't doing them at the University of Oregon. When Al Starr found out I got accepted to Stanford, he says, look, uh, why don't you go to Stanford, but promise you'll come back to Oregon. And I said, fine, and I broke my promise. You never went back to Oregon? No. Now, as I understand, when you went to Stanford, they wanted you to sign a, 
document saying that every product or device that you developed would become the intellectual property of Stanford. Well, they asked me to sign that when I went on the faculty. Yeah. What did you say when they asked you to do that? I said, I'll sign it and resign, <laughs> or I won't sign it and I'll stay. So I stayed. You stayed. As you've gone through the years and have developed, you, you've become obviously one of the most noted serial entrepreneurs, developers. Does the process of invention or development get easier as you go along? Has it been easier as you go along? Or does it become more difficult in some respects? Uh, I think it's become extremely difficult by comparison to what, if I look back at, at um, the time frame and what one had to do with a balloon embolectomy catheter, at most, it probably cost twelve to fifteen thousand dollars to get that in commercial use. Uh, it probably would cost, I don't know, a million, two million now. Mm -hmm. The regulatory path was, uh, you know, essentially non-existent except your peers would overlook what you were doing. So that was, you know, easy. Uh, the informed Perfect. consent was the informed consent of an embolectomy, not the use of something to help you do right. it. So uh, there, there's just a lot more things that you have to deal with now versus what you did then. Those are external, uh, from an internal perspective, from your own creative juices, from your own, you know, and, and uh, actually my, my graduate degree is actually in literature and there's a, there's a theory that all great writers have 10 years in them, no matter how long they live. And then they write 10 years of great work and then the rest of it's just spent apologizing or failing to meet up to their own. As you now extend your career into third or fourth decade of it, do you find the ideas still come as, as, as quickly and as fertilely as you'd like, or, or was there a, you know, do you think back and say, gee, those days I used to have thousands of ideas and now I can barely think of one? I think he's asked me if I'm senile. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> no, actually, I, I, uh, uh, I, I think you get a little bit better as you get older with ideas. I think you learn to recognize which ones are really stupid a little quicker. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, you know, the, the origin of ideas is recognizing what doesn't work. And I, I think uh, as long as you're reasonably functional, you can recognize what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can also, you know, conceive of what would be better. Mm -hmm. so you may get a lot more, what happens now, you get a lot more people to help you. Right. So I want to hear, I want you to tell us a story about the bubble oxygenator, which you developed while consulting for Edwards. It led eventually to the breakup of Jim Bentley and Lowell Edwards and the creation of Bentley Labs. Tell that story because it was also, I mean, from a financial point of view, was that your greatest financial success? You know, I never Bentley bothered, Labs. yeah, I don't, I, I've never bothered to analyze that. Really? I, I, no, I, I haven't. It, it was a good one. It was, a good, it was one of the most <laughs> successful device deals of all yeah, time. Yeah, but it was. When American Hospital, I bought yeah, Bentley Labs. Yeah. The, the story is interesting from the standpoint of, you know, what makes technology work and what doesn't make it work. At that time, the issue was oxygenation doing uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, when you put somebody on a heart-lung machine, and the best way to oxygenate. And um, at that time, we used disc oxygenators, which were about six foot long, and took about 20 units of blood to prime it. So that means you had, if you're going to do two cases a day, you need 40 units of blood. And then you had to process it. Uh, so the whole thing was very, very expensive and used a lot of blood. And the issue was, could you come up with what they call a low prime auctioneer where you didn't use a lot of blood and you didn't cause trauma to the blood elements? So the uh, 
Edwards had two programs. One was a membrane auctioneer, and one was a bubble auctioneer. And Law and Jim Bentley, who was the president, got into a conflict, which was the best route to take. And, and um, I was kind of put in a position where I had to choose sides. And, and I chose sides based on an observation which is interesting is that in those days it took about three to four hours of oxygenation to get through a, a uh, heart operation on pump. In other words, you're three to four hours on pump. The operation maybe lasts five to six. The bubble auctioneer was, was good marginally up to four hours. In some patients it wasn't good that long. And a membrane will last about four to five hours. But if you looked at where the use was going and you looked at the pump times, what they call pump times, the number of hours on the auctioneer, what was going on was out in the general community versus in the universities, they took about an hour and a half less of pump time in the community because they weren't encumbered with a lot of things that you're encumbered with in a teaching institution. So. Jim said, you, I don't want to do the membrane, I want to do the bubbler. And uh, Lowell said, Tom, which one do you want to help with? And I'd already helped Lowell with the membrane, and we couldn't manufacture it on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. We had a reject rate of about 80%, so every 100 we made, 20 were good. Well, for a whole bunch of different reasons, and prior the primary reason, the insight into what people really could do in a practice environment. We went with a Bentley auctioneer. Jim bought it from Edwards and he offered $100,000 payable over five years. And at six years, Jim sold it back, I think, for $375 million to one Edwards. One. Yeah. One of the biggest device deals. At that of time, the time, it was the biggest device deal at that mm -hmm. time. Did that end your relationship with Edwards? No. No. You made a consultant there for a long time? Well, in certain fields, but certainly not in oxygenation. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You've been obviously successful in so many, developing so many different products, but, you know, uh, success doesn't always come. Give us a sense of some of your failures or some of your disappointments. Is there a device or a device concept that you know can work, would make a great contribution to clinical practice, but you simply haven't figured out how to make it work yet? There's not enough time. Say, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, there, I mean, there's, there's more than one, but there's several that I've spent money and time on and, and have failed, I haven't really got into the marketplace. And the one that still there's a critical need for is a continuous non-invasive blood pressure monitor. Mm -hmm. The beat by beat will give you a blood pressure. Uh, simply because when you think about it, when you go to the doctor's office to take somebody's blood pressure, it's an artificial environment and the beats are separated, systolic from diastolic, and it's a, it's a minuscule sampling, sampling of your blood pressure over a 24-hour period. So it's kind of like an EKG Holter monitor, if you can see it beat by beat for every beat and analyze it. And uh, that probably would help in the diagnosis of hypertension, but also help in the dosage of blood pressure and managing hypertension. Neither one of those are currently available, and it's a huge need. Do you think that, I mean, do you think that you'll be able to solve that problem eventually? Well, I, I've bent my pick on it so many times I know I can't, but <laughs> I'm sure there's somebody smart enough to do that. What about devices that, you've, that you have successfully developed, but that simply haven't caught on? devices that simply haven't won over physicians that you think are great ideas? Yeah, there, there's examples of those too and, and it's a matter of sometimes physicians have a, such a strong reference point uh, that's documented and repeated use and success that they can't transition to anything else even though it may be as good or simpler to use. Mm -hmm. It's just a different activity for them. They don't want to deal with it. Well, give us an example because, you know, you, you talk to a lot of device company executives. And they tell you that the most thankless job in the world is designing new technology for 
for surgeons because surgeons are so conservative in their practice patterns. You've built a career developing new devices for, for surgeons. Is it as tough as a lot of device companies, uh, executives I, think? No, I don't think so. Part of the problem that they have, they go out and ask surgeons what they want rather than observe what they need. If you ask a physician what they want, they may want something that allows them to do a new procedure in their specialty. And they'll tell you how great it's going to be. But when you really sit back and look at it, it may be handled uh, quite well by another specialty. So it, it's really, uh, you know, when you talk to physicians, you got to learn the difference between what they say, what they want, what they'll pay for, and what they actually do. Have you ever been so discouraged over a device that didn't work or a device that worked but didn't get adopted that you felt just like, quitting and I guess generally speaking I think it's particularly relevant for for students who are thinking about developing technology how do you deal with, with discouragement or failure how do you know when to just give up on an idea well I don't know I, I think failure is a preamble to success it's just okay that didn't work you take that information that tells you what not to do and often that leads you in a path as to what to do so I guess I'm too thick-headed to get discouraged, but if there's a need, there's a need. Just because what you tried to do didn't address that need doesn't mean the need goes away. Mm -hmm. Are there any issues in managing success? Or is it just a whole bowl, just a huge bowl of cherries when you, things work out? But did you, ever, did you ever successfully develop a device and just say, wow, I didn't expect this to happen and I'm not certain that it's, it's what I thought it was going to be. Well, it is what it is. Uh, I, I, I didn't think the balloon catheter would be a preamble to anything but an isolated procedure of taking a blood clot out, and it's been a preamble to minimally invasive surgery. It's been a preamble to dilatation of arteries. It's been a preamble to endovascular surgery. I had no concept of that. The list of companies that have come out of your workshop are truly impressive. GSI, CTS, and your X biopsis, to name just a few. Is there a common characteristic to all of those, a common feature or key to their success? I think they, uh, are, there is obviously. Uh, one, it fills a real clinical need mm -hmm. and it's easy to use. Mm -hmm. And it's cost effective. Has that always been true, or is that no. truer of, the, of a more recent technology? I, I think the, the cost-effective issue is, is, is probably an element that has come to bear in the last 10 years in a very significant way. What is your view on company creation? You started your, your development career as a consultant to a large company, or I guess Edwards was in the process of becoming a large company. But you're more noted now for the companies that you created that come out of your workshop. Uh, why did you just stay and take everything through Edwards? At what point did you say, gee, you know what, maybe I should start creating companies around that? Well, and actually started out of frustration because what happens in a big company, you develop technology and they have 90% market share. Mm -hmm. There's no incentive for them to improve it mm -hmm. because it costs money to build the next generation. So they end up looking at it, an issue of hitting the bottom line, competing with themselves, and so out of frustration, I, I just went and did things on my own. Mm -hmm. Was GSI the first company that you started on your own? No, I can't remember uh, the first one. It wasn't GSI. Uh, Hancock Laboratories was probably... Oh, Hancock Laboratories? Yeah. Okay. And what was the technology at that, that Hancock Laboratories? That was the first... Um, Xenografter tissue heart valve. Uh -huh. um, and essentially, that, that was um, the intellectual property was Edwards had a six month option on it, uh -huh. decided not to do it, so it came back to me. And uh, Warren Hancock was the uh, marketing sales president of Edwards Life Sciences at that time and 
So he and I went off and started Hancock. But you put he put his name on it, not your name on it. Yeah. Why did you? Why didn't you put your name on well, it? Well, I, I kind of recognize that in in medicine, if your name goes on everything, they kind of look at you like a used car salesman, and. Uh, it, that wasn't important to me, and it hadn't been important since then. It's important to get the product out without any bias. Mm -hmm. So I haven't really fussed with that a whole bunch since then. Mm -hmm. You learned a couple of things from Jack Cranley, patent it, put your name on it. But as you now talk to doctors, to physicians, and to fledging entrepreneurs today, are there two or three keys to success that you think are kind of the bedrock of a successful career as, a, as an entrepreneur and as an innovator? Uh, I don't know. If you start off, I think, with an overwhelming desire to start a company to make money, you probably ought not be in the business of medical devices. Because it, although there's nothing wrong with that, it's just if that's your original focus, it, somehow you miss the concepts that are really important. And the, the important things are what I call clinical utility. You got to really know what works for the patient. And if it works for the patient, then you'll end up, you know, deriving some value out of it. But uh, I see a lot of guys just, well, I got to start a company, I'm going to make a bunch of money. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. you, one the, you once said to me that one of the things that a lot of entrepreneurs don't realize is that value creation and developing new devices comes from multiple sources. What yeah. did you mean by that? Well, there's a certain value allocation that, that in particularly in this day and age, you need people from different disciplines. You need intellectual property attorneys. You need regular corporate attorneys. You need good engineers. And then of the engineers, you need different kinds of engineers. You know, you need uh, the, the guy that conceptualizes, and, and then you need a guy that can prototype, and then you need a production engineer. Then you need what I call a finisher. A lot of engineers get to 90%, can't finish at 10%. And that's a very complex interface. Uh, you need regulatory people. And so you, you have to understand value allocation. All these people create value. They bring something to the table. And if you think just because you had the idea, you brought all the value, you're not going to get there because somebody has to implement that idea. Mm -hmm. And one individual can't do it. And you kind of institutionalized that in your practice, but how does a young entrepreneur go out and get that stuff? I mean, wh where, do you go to, where do you go to get that, that expertise? Well, it's all around. Uh, I mean, I started out using graduate students at Stanford in the ME program, and they worked with me in my office. Uh, I would use attorneys, um, some pro bono. Casey How'd McGlynn, do he doesn't do that anymore, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's through relationships and friends. And, and uh, that's why you learn to know who's in the industry and, uh, you know, how to access them. Mm -hmm. Two or three that you didn't mention as corporate partners, I wonder if you could just give us your sense of and, and how your relationship with them has changed over the year. One is venture capitalists. Yeah. You formed a venture capital firm. Yes. Three Arts, which yeah. is our sponsor tonight, or one of our yes. sponsoring organizations. Why did you do that? Well, the it's, once again, it wasn't by design. What, there's a point in time where I was approached by different venture companies that wanted me to become a partner. When I looked at what they were doing at that time, which is in the early 90s, they were kind of like grading papers of graduate students without really being there in creating the papers. So I was not interested in grading a bunch of ideas and papers and I was interested in creating an environment where we could help people uh, develop the ideas and in, in the products. And so it was, it was kind of an a entrepreneurial venture fund that we started called Three Arch. So, and I don't think my relationship with the venture community has changed that much. The venture community has changed a lot. In what ways? Well, I, I think uh, they respond to the economic times like 
anybody else. They uh, are into conserving capital, so they're doing less and doing fewer deals. You know, it, it, we're to speak frankly, a lot of, uh, so this no disrespect to any VCs we have in the audience, but a lot of entrepreneurs and founders of companies, you know, become quite disenchanted with their experience with venture capitals. Do you, do you understand that as a process, or are they being naive? You, you get what you get. I think I understand both sides of it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a lot of VC firms, all of them say, well, we bring more than money. Well, most of them, not all, and it's not all the same within each firm, uh, but in general, they do bring money. That's very, very valuable, but you sometimes delude yourself by thinking they bring more than that. But sometimes they do. So it's quite variable even within individual firms. What about corporate partners? Now you you had a long and you had a long and successful relationship with yeah. with Edwards and and Bentley sold to American Hospital Supply. So you you've seen on both sides. Yes. I mean, Edwards also became part of the American Hospital Supply as well, yes. and, and then later uh, Baxter. But what's your view of corporate partners? And because so much of the device industry, particularly company creation, is really frankly underwritten today by by big companies, uh, either because they are early investors themselves or because the promise of an acquisition later is the one thing that lures investors into putting money into companies in the first place. What's your view of a partnership with Guyton or Johnson & Johnson or well, it, Scientific? You know, it's what you make of it. It's like any relationship, it's what you make of it. But what's happening is the corporate, large corporate communities recognize that the venture guys by and large, are not very aggressive, so it's created a huge opportunity for a lot of the corporate people to come in and essentially take the place of the venture capitalists. And they're not only doing it the mezzanine rounds, B, C, and D. They're doing it early, right. uh, which fills a need. So, you know, you got to be careful uh, what you give them if you give them too much in the way of distribution rights or certain assets in the way of intellectual property, then, then you diminish your ability to exit as an independent company. So you, all these things are critically important. As you develop, create companies that come out of your workshop, what kind of a relationship do you like to have? I mean, you've had a lot of talented managers that have been associated with companies that have come out of your workshop. Alan, Alan Wills here. and. Uh, Rich Ferrari from CTS. At what point do you turn the relation to turn the management of those companies over to professional managers? At what point do you like to stay actively involved in the day-to-day -day management? Yeah, I turn it over as soon as I can. As soon as you can. Yeah, because they have to take ownership, and um, it, it, I'm, it'd be delusional for me to think that I could run a company. Mm -hmm. So you see yourself primarily as the idea generators. The well, and also an enabler. I, I, I can provide uh, certain resources like relationships with physicians, relationships with large companies, uh, sometimes engineering, so, and also understanding the regulatory issues, uh, and I do have access to the FDA on an ongoing basis, so I'm, I'm pretty tuned in to what's going on and what to watch out for. Mm -hmm. Do you include uh, eventual relationship with corporate partners as part of your thinking about the, the path that your companies will take, or is that really not one of the things that you're particularly interested in? Well, it all depends upon the product mm -hmm. and uh, what corporate partner it is. Sometimes an early relationship in conjunction with um, Two or three VCs is a good idea. Mm -hmm. And you get involved in those decisions? I mean, that's something that you yes. like to plan out and to participate well, in? Yeah, I, I mean, I offer guidance, yes. Now, I know that you don't particularly like the term incubator. No. For your organization, but, but what, why not? Well, we're a percolator. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think when you, you, the concept of incubation is you put an egg in there in a certain days, you know, within plus or minus two days, yeah. something hatches. And um, you, you, can't, um, you can't really schedule innovation. Mm -hmm. And that's what 
you, you know, incubator means you got something coming out on a scheduled basis. So in Fogarty, we have a bunch of things swirling around and some are, um, you know, percolating quicker. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they quit percolating and then they go on a back burner. And what do you do with them after that? Well, sometimes they'll sit there for two or three years and it, something may cause you to bring it back out. So there's usually more than one concept going on mm -hmm. and at a different intensity. How much of that is within Fogarty Engineering is generated by you, your staff? How much are you importing ideas from people outside? And kind of uh, You know, I, I don't know how you identify that. It's kind of like 50-50, I guess. Uh, I have physicians or somebody come and say, this is a real problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll, I'll say, yeah, it is. Or I'll say, oh, it is. Uh, and if I say, oh, it is, I go try to identify, is this really a problem? And then how frequent and how big a problem and how could one address it? And uh, if somebody comes in with concepts or ideas and I think it's worth pursuing, I try to get that individual involved. Mm -hmm. You mentioned before that early in your career there was this kind of bias against physicians or surgeons who are involved in the commercialization of new device technology. How much of that bias do you think exists today or remains today? Or is it really a, a, a wide open marketplace in which anybody who um, has an idea is eager and willing to, to commercialize it? No, I, I think there's a, there's a lot less bias against that in this day and age or, than there was in the early 60s. But it's interesting, even within the same institution, uh, somebody who could be called a creative innovator may be perceived by others in that same institution as somebody tardy and not to be dealt with. And there are some institutions uh, that say the relationship with industry is above the academic purpose. Mm -hmm. Is it a limiting factor, you think, on technology development in the field today? Do you think there's a lot of ideas out there that are not being funded? I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. I think it, it, um, it may cause people to do things differently, and it may cause people to be much less efficient. Mm -hmm. You've made somewhat of a transition from devices that were used primarily early on in vascular and cardiovascular surgery to areas outside of that. I mean, Satiety is a company that you had a hand, major hand in that's in a completely different area. How much are you interested in projects or device developments outside of the area of cardio or vascular surgery? Well, the, the bigger the need, and the less well it's addressed, the more I become interested. Mm -hmm. And obesity is one of them. Mm -hmm. But is, was, that, was the satiety project uh, a kind of outlier? You found one or, or I mean, so much venture capital money has poured into cardiovascular devices yes. over the last 15 yeah. years. Do you think we've reached a point of saturation in cardiovascular devices and so the really unmet needs are going to be in other kinds of areas or do you think, was, was that just an outlier and you had a good idea in one area of obesity and decided to pursue that? Well, no, I, I think uh, there will always be a need in all areas and you look at, I mean, a simplistic way to look at it is the incidence or occurrence of a disease state. And 10 years ago, I think in the United States, if you looked at all the states, less than 20% of the population in any given state was overweight. Now, in all states, at least 50% of the population are overweight. So it's kind of an endemic thing. And you look at what, what it causes. It causes hypertension, causes diabetes, it causes certain arthritis. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's an epidemic. So it's easy to say, you know, let's do something about it. Thinking back over your career, do you think it's easier today uh, for a young entrepreneur with a good idea to see his idea commercialized, or do you think it's harder? Well, I, I think to get attention, it's easier. To implement it is harder. What do you mean by that? Well, uh, I mean, you're going to have an idea, but to get it through all the process and, and 
you know, from the concept all the way through clinical use and application, commercialization and reimbursement is much more complex. You, you just can't do it the way you used to. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that is again limiting factor on technology? Do you, how optimistic are you right now today that, that the kinds of technology developments, device development techno that we've seen over the course of the last 20 or 30 years will continue on into the future? Well, I'm pretty optimistic. Two things have changed, and if you look at the, the, the things that are in a critical path now that are making it difficult is, is regulatory and reimbursement. Mm -hmm. If you look at the regulatory end from the device side, it's not unusual for a given device to be outdated within a seven to ten year period. Well, it may take you five to seven years to get through the regulatory path. Mm -hmm. It may take you another two years to get reimbursement. So the, 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 the rapid advances of technology have outstripped the ability of certain agencies to respond to it. Mm -hmm. Those two agencies are critical, reimbursement and regulatory. Nobody pays for something, nobody's going to develop it. Mm -hmm. Your reputation as a winemaker is well known in this field. Um, how did you get into winemaking? I like wine. <laughs> no, I, I, I met a friend at Stanford that made wine as a hobby, and mm -hmm. I started making wine with him. So, As you get involved in those kinds of things, does your passion for developing new device technologies wane, or do you, feel you, do you find yourself still as excited today about ideas that are percolating in your mind as, they, as you were 20 years ago? No, I'm still much more excited about innovation. Uh, Winemaking is, is more uh, witchcraft, I think, than anything. <laughs> okay, great. Um, well, let me ask you a, a final question. I, I would have ended on that, but do you think that there's so much diff there's so many small companies today find it difficult to get from point of creation point of launching to a kind of viable independent status do you think it's possible today for small companies to develop and grow or is a sale to a big company simply inevitable in today's environment no i i don't think it's inevitable uh i i think um no, I don't think it's inevitable. I think it's a more common exit now. Mm -hmm. um, that whether that's going to be true two or three years from now, the, the issue with emerging technology and emerging companies is it, you reach a point where you have to break even, and then shortly after that, you have to make money. And if the investors are, are purely VCs, and uh, they're not looking to make dividends, they're looking for a big nut, and so that means you have to either go public or you have to be sold, and the IPO market's dried up, so the exit is, you know, the big companies. And, and in one way, um, I think there are more big companies now looking than there were when the IPO market was much more attractive, but there probably aren't enough. Well. Here's hoping, well, you can keep growing companies so that they can become the next Boston Scientifics and Guidance and companies like that. Um, I think we're at the end of our session now. So, Tom, thank you very much. <laughs> round of applause. Hi, I'm Bill Overall. I'm a, also a fellow in the Biodesign Innovation Program. Um, you, talk, uh, you obviously have a good background in, in medicine and uh, and obviously, you've also done a lot of great things that are along the engineering lines. Uh, a lot of the people in the audience have, a, have uh, their training in engineering as opposed to your training mostly in medicine. Do you have any specific advice for us in terms of how we might uh, bridge the gap between medicine and engineering and how, how we might bring ourselves to the point of being able to make these, these leaps of innovation? You know, what, what I do, uh within our group is whenever they're confronted with a clinical problem, I have them go observe what the clinical problem is. So that means, uh, I mean, they can, they can read books and say, oh, this is an aneurysm. But then I make certain they get exposure to the environment in which that thing is fixed. 
So before they start doing anything, I, I get them to understand how the problem is currently handled. Not only in the operating room, but it's, essentially they have to have enough insight what's the post-operative care, how long does it take, and what some of the follow-up issues are. Now, they don't have to observe all those, but they got to know them. But I do like to spend a lot of time in the operating room. Uh, if, if it's the operating room or if it's a cath environment, in the cath environment. Do you, have question? Do you think a, 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 an inventor with a medical background has an advantage over one that's pure engineer, or can you simply by observing get across that, well, I, that chasm? No, I think you can cross it simply by observing. And actually, uh, I like my engineers to do some of the animal work and could ever work. And actually, there, a lot of them are very good technicians just by nature. I mean, they're better than a lot of first-year interns or residents. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Next question. Hi, Lisa Krieger. I write for the science section of the San Jose Mercury News. A lot of times you hear of technologies being blamed for healthcare inflation, and I'm wondering, you mentioned cost-effectiveness, whether you see managed care inhibiting the adoption of some of these technologies um, in the marketplace. You know, the... It all depends on how you calculate cost effectiveness. The unfortunate part, a lot of institutions and managed care groups do it on an annualized basis, uh, rather than on a longitudinal basis. And what you have to do is do it on a longitudinal basis. And uh, if you do that, you'll come up with a different answer. Uh, so if you uh, intervene in a minimally invasive way, before the onset of symptoms and complications, a lot of managed care people say, well, it's unnecessary. Without thinking, if that had been let go and you developed a complication, it would have cost a lot more and perhaps you wouldn't have returned that patient to full functional activity. The problem, nobody wants to pay for those outcome analysis on a longitudinal basis. I think technology, if handled properly, is not the problem, it's a solution. So in the design of a service or a device or a combination thereof, if you look at it up front saying, I got to do this in a more cost effective way, you'll come up with something different if you don't have that concept in mind. Mm -hmm. And I think more and more people are beginning to realize that and design to that end, not totally. But you know, it's like uh, cost-effective flight often comes at a price you don't want to pay. Mm. You know, there's a few airplanes ended up in swamps because right. people oh, were so concerned about cost-effectiveness. So you gotta be careful. Thank you. Next question. Hi, I'm John Toth with the Tennyson West of Financial Services firm in the Bay Area. My question is related to marketing or demonstrating demand. You've emphasized over and over again um, solving a need, observing a need in the market, and, meet, and developing technology to meet that problem, solve that problem. But purchasing today is so decentralized, and there are so many perspectives brought to bear in whether or not to purchase a device. What strategies or what is your favorite strategy for demonstrating demand when faced with um, the regulatory and reimbursement agencies that really string out the process of demonstrating someone will part with dollars from their wallet for this? Well, you know, that, that was a question that would take the next three hours. <laughs> but, but I think if, if, uh, if you get something in the hands of a physician, and, it, the, and he says, he can say many things. Oh, that's nice. That's usually not very good, okay? <laughs> or it, it, the worst thing is he says that's interesting. That's even worse. Uh, so what are we going for? But what, what you really want to say, I need that, and uh, I'm going to order it, and here's who you go to to get it ordered. Now that's not the end of it because currently there's a whole bunch of things in the way. The OR committee, the purchasing committee, the cost containment committee, and probably two or three other committees I'm failing to remember. But 
The whole process is a lot longer. But if it's in an area where the, the, the physician says, this is better for my patient, I really want it and I need it, it shortens the operation and, and it uh, minimizes the trauma, then, then you got something that'll work, even though it may cost a little more. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think that for the most part, while I'm not denying the managed care pressures or the marketing pressures or those other committee influence, if you've got a product that physicians really want and assist, improves patient care, the hospital buys it. If you don't, that's when you run into problems. So I, I see managed care more as weeding out the process than as hmm. weeding out, you know, in, in, indifferent or less than valuable technology hands rather than blocking innovative technology. Thank you. Thank you. Next. I'm Mike Murray. I'm a student in the Biodesign Innovation Program. You said that innovation was not something that could be done on a schedule. Um, for the companies that you've started, in a sense, you've seeded them with the innovation. But once they become companies, the venture capitalists have uh, schedules by which they want to see an exit strategy. Or in big companies, there's a lot of uh, vision on the quarterly bottom line. Um, since innovation is unpredictable, how do you, in a company, continue to be innovative? even under the quarterly pressures or the immediate pressures, since it's unpredictable? Well, I, I think ever since I've been exposed to big companies, that's their challenge. And it's still their challenge. Uh, it, if <laughs> They don't want to cannibalize themselves, but if you're going to be innovative, that's exactly what you've got to do. So uh, I have talked to every major company about this issue that you name from Baxter, American Hospital, uh, Medtronic, J&J. Uh, &J. Uh, and they're always looking how to do it, but somehow they can't keep their hands off. They'll say, oh, you go be our innovative group. But uh, at some point in time, because they're not seeing a return, just like a VC, they'll intervene mm -hmm. and try to do something. So I, I think the seed of innovation will always lie within small companies with a high degree of focus. Mm -hmm. I don't think it will ever get out into a large company. If it does, it won't be a repetitive, frequent occurrence. Yep. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dan Francis, also with the Biodesign Innovation Program. A lot of what you've talked about is based on a market size suitable for a business. Do you think there's a place in the medical device field, though, for smaller market ideas, maybe pediatric cardiology or even bringing technologies to areas where there's not money to pay for them? I, I think there is, but uh, you talk about orphan drugs, and there are certain benefits that our regulatory bodies will give to orphan drugs. They haven't done that with devices, but there's a whole slew of, of, of what, when you look at it, you say, the market really isn't big enough to create a company. And how do you get in that marketplace? And that is a real challenge, and I still don't know how to do it. Sometimes you can do it by creating a company, but that's a big risk. But uh, I see products, no, I don't know. Very, very often. I look at it and say, that, yeah, there's a real need. But I can't figure out how to develop that from the standpoint of a return. And, uh, and I don't know how to do it. I wish I could tell you I could, but I don't. Because there aren't many people willing to do that unless you go to some you know, foundation or agency that recognizes they just want to do that because they have a focus on that. And in fact, one of the major questions that VCs ask is, is this a company or is it a product? Yeah. And, and they're they, extremely yeah. reluctant to fund the latter. They, they don't want to fund a product uh, at all. And, they, um, and they, they, they have visions of a certain market size. It used to be a heavy $100 million market size that they weren't interested. Well, in the device area, there are, there are a number of products that exceed $100 million, but there's a whole bunch that are from 50 to 100. And they don't like to fund them. And you can't get a company to focus on it because they say, how much of market share does that get me and at what cost? So they all have the same issues. Thanks. Thank you. 
I think one more question. Bill Evans from Bridge Design. Um, I'm curious about your early roots as an innovator and uh, how one becomes educated or skilled at becoming an innovator in the sense that here we are at Stanford talking about uh, you know, Stanford improving and obviously trying to bring on more innovators, but I wonder whether we shouldn't all be spending a bit more time in the middle school getting kids to pull cars apart or something, because quite clearly you're a tinkerer, and I certainly took apart quite a few things when I was a kid, and I wonder about this uh, dilemma between you know, being educated and yet also being a good innovator and, and the culture and uh, background that leads to that. Well, I, I, I don't know. I've asked related questions like yours before, and so it's caused me to think about it. I think some individuals have a greater propensity to innovate just because they have a greater propensity. I think if you're, you're, that your ability uh, and to bring that to the fore is precipitated sometimes out of necessity, uh, sometimes just because the environment in which you're brought up, you know, creates that uh, uh, opportunity to do it. Um, I don't think everybody can be an innovator. I think some can and some can't and some can do it a lot better than others. But certainly being in the environment uh, promotes it. I, I, it's more of a mentoring issue than it is reading a book on how to innovate. I don't think. So you got to watch somebody, oh, they did that because of this. Do you think there's something about an academic setting that stifles innovation? Do innovators really need to just be free to do whatever they want to do and that an academic setting sometimes stifles or discourages well, that? I, certainly in medicine, uh, because of the amount and the mass that you're required to learn, you don't have time to, time to question anything. All right. you do is read and spit it back out and you never get through. Right. So in medicine, um, and also in medicine you're taught to do no harm you do no harm by doing what you've always done before. Right. He has a given track record. So in a field of medicine, I think the way we're taught certainly deters innovation. Right. Uh, in the other fields, I'm not quite so sure because I haven't been in those other fields, but right. medicine most certainly. Right. But it is interesting that every time an electrical engineer gets particularly badly handicapped, we do seem to get an incredible upwelling of of uh, problem solving around that particular topic. There's many companies founded around that, and it's more that. I wonder if, you know, particularly med medical school is a good example. It's so hard to get in that it pr probably the kind of people that have that, that tinkering ability and more manual skills that might lead to good innovators later on have a bit of a tougher time getting through that. So perhaps we're missing something in, in how we, we recruit into that. I think that's probably true. There's certainly an argument you made that the, the progress of medicine has been in, toward physicians who are so procedure oriented and so technically adept that they've lost certain other skills, whether it's one of the skills they've lost or the ability to tinker is another question. Thanks. Great. Any other questions? Tom, thank you very much. And uh, thank you all. <laughs>